ahora 23 participantes, esperando que quizás ingresen un, un par más. Este webinar, recuerden, estaba inicialmente dirigido únicamente para los participantes directos del proyecto, es decir, para los coordinadores, para los representantes políticos y para los representantes técnicos. De manera que es un número bastante aceptable que tenemos en este momento. Les agradezco mucho por su cumplimiento. Este webinar pues, va a estar eh, dirigido principalmente a revisar los conceptos básicos para la gestión de RAE y va a estar a cargo de nuestras colegas eh, Dipali y Michelle, a quienes la gran mayoría de ustedes ya conocen. Eh, no obstante, eh, le voy a pedir el favor a Alfredo, nuestro gerente de proyecto, para que haga la presentación eh, formal de cada una de ellas que van a estar a cargo de este webinar. Y eh, seguidamente damos comienzo directamente al webinar. Entonces, eh, te doy la palabra, Alfredo. Buenos días, eh, colegas. La mayoría de que están allí en Latinoamérica y para algunos de ustedes, buenas tardes. Me complace en esta ocasión presentar a Dipali y a Michelle, a quien posiblemente la mayoría de ustedes ya conocen. Dipali está basada en Mumbai y es una experta internacional en gestión de residuos electrónicos y en responsabilidad extendida del productor. Posee un doctorado de la Universidad de St. Gallen, Suiza, donde su tesis fue sobre modelos para pronosticar el flujo de residuos al final de la vida útil de los bienes de consumo duradero. Y además cuenta con más de 16 años de experiencia laboral internacional en países de Asia, Europa y en los Estados Unidos. En la Universidad de las Naciones Unidas ha desarrollado una importante labor en el establecimiento de las actividades de capacitación organizadas por la iniciativa STEP, un foro que es apoyado por las Naciones Unidas sobre problemas de los residuos electrónicos. También es autora de varios informes de investigación para la Comisión Europea y para el proyecto Horizonte 2020 relacionados con la temática de los recursos y aspectos de reciclaje de los residuos electrónicos. Desde el año 2004 ha trabajado en una variedad de proyectos particularmente relacionados con recursos secundarios y algunos de sus proyectos actualmente en curso abarcan políticas y legislación, negocios y financiamiento, así como actividades de desarrollo de capacidades para las partes interesadas a lo largo de la cadena de valor. Y en esta ocasión, debido a la barrera del lenguaje, pues eh, Dipali va a estar asistida por Michelle, a quien también ustedes conocen por uh, su actividad que ha desarrollado en el eh, marco de, de nuestros IWAN, particularmente el año pasado en el que tuvimos ya en Costa Rica. Entonces, eh, procedo ahora a presentarla y quiero decirles en primer lugar que Michelle es eh, investigadora de, las, de la Universidad de Naciones Unidas desde el año 2016 y trabaja para la unidad operativa del programa de, de ciclos sostenibles. Desde el año 2007, en que ella se graduó en la Universidad Católica de Tegucigalpa, Honduras, con una licenciatura en eh, Ingeniería Ambiental, ha trabajado inicialmente como analista en el Ministerio de Energía y Recursos Naturales, Medio Ambiente y Minas de Honduras. Luego, en el año 2012, obtuvo una maestría en la Universidad Técnica Real de Estocolmo, Suecia, y en 2014, Trabajó para Flow Cert Fair Trade en el Departamento de Desarrollo Empresarial y la Unidad de Cambio Climático. Posteriormente, y en la actualidad, ha trabajado para varios proyectos que apoyan la cuantificación de los RAE y eh, de baterías a nivel nacional y regional en toda Europa y el continente americano, así como en el mapeo o trazabilidad de flujos de materiales. Participado también en la elaboración de modelos estadísticos de cuantificación de RAE y su impacto ambiental y ha proporcionado capacitaciones institucionales tanto en Unión Europea como en los países en vías de desarrollo. 
Esto ha ayudado a fortalecer la gestión, la elaboración de estadísticas y las políticas en materia de residuos sólidos. Aparte de eso, eh, quiero comentarles que actualmente Michelle es estudiante de doctorado en la Universidad de, de Leiden, en el Instituto de Ciencias Ambientales. Yo quisiera referirme a ambas en el sentido de que han sido excelentes colaboradoras con el proyecto nuestro y tal vez en algunos momentos han tenido que enfrentar exigencias fuertes de parte de Carlos y Mías. Así que quiero agradecerles por eh, siempre la actitud excelente que han tenido frente a esto, porque en realidad eh, nosotros tomamos estos temas como un apostolado. En realidad nosotros eh, estamos conscientes de que este es un proyecto único y es un proyecto que tiene que demostrar a través de todo el esfuerzo que estamos desarrollando, a través de eh, lo que podamos hacer cada uno de nosotros, incluyendo todos ustedes, en beneficio de la región para que esto pueda servir como de una base, de un ejemplo, de un modelo adecuado para otros países de, del mundo. Entonces, en este sentido, me complace dar la bienvenida a ellas y esperamos que esta presentación sea de provecho para todos. Gracias. Entonces, adelante. The floor is yours. Gracias, Alfredo. Carlos. Uh, buenos días a todos. Espero todos estén bien de salud. And that's uh, more or less uh, all the Spanish I could learn. Uh, thanks. <laughs> So I hope it's okay for everyone if I uh, switch to English. And um, of course, uh, Michelle has uh, you know, been very kind to translate the slides in, in Spanish. So hopefully what you see on the screen and what I'm saying in English uh, do match up. But if it's not very clear, just don't hesitate to raise your hands to interrupt and you know clarify um, if you have any questions about. So. Uh, So thank you very much for uh, joining online and uh, participating in our webinar, uh, which continues actually, uh, you know, part of the eWaste Academy. Uh, it's a bit of a refresher for those who were there last year in Costa Rica. So hi to everybody. I'm, I'm glad to at least uh, see you online. And uh, to, to, to uh, those who joined the project in the past year, Uh, I'm glad that uh, we have a chance to at least uh, share some of these basic concepts uh, and then key terms and key uh, um, keywords, as such, uh, which uh, we use very often in, in the e-waste uh, domain. So that's a little bit the idea of the presentation today, to just get a bit of a sense of uh, what are these key concepts to set up the uh, the frame for uh, all uh, you know the, the upcoming webinars the series that we plan until september so we just go through a few um, quick uh, uh, topics of course not in detail because the experts or each of those topics will go much deeper this is just to give you an overview picture of what uh, the whole webinar series is going to be about and then of course you know the face to face in person evam uh, would be uh, taking that much further So, uh, yeah, but before we start into the main presentation, uh, we thought uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, a test uh, to just, uh, you know, get a little uh, familiar with our interactive uh, tool, Mentimeter. For those who were there last year, we used this as well. So you might be familiar with it, but for those uh, who are not, it uh, would be great to, um, to, to start. Um, I can just, yeah, okay, this works, great. So, uh, yeah, uh, we will have a couple of quizzes or questions online. And uh, for this, you know, I'd request you to be either uh, on a phone or on a laptop. Uh, you can access this uh, link, uh, www.menti.com. And then you're asked for a code uh, and, and you get to, um, yeah select your options so uh our first one uh, if michelle actually if you could pull up our first uh, quiz for the day that would be great because we just wanted to know a little bit uh, where everybody is coming from and and you know the countries that uh, we 
have represented in the webinar. So, uh, yeah, I'll explain a little bit in Spanish what you mentioned. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. So, muy buenos días a todos. Uh, normalmente en los webinarios o talleres les solicitamos que guarden y que no abran otra página web, pero como la mayoría de ustedes sabrán, eh, de las experiencias pasadas en diferentes talleres, nosotros nos gusta que los talleres y bueno, los webinarios sean bien interactivos. Para ello utilizaremos una aplicación que se llama Mentimita. Eh, la vez pasada. Mm, tal vez a las personas que tienen el micrófono, por favor, les solicito que los apaguen. Bueno, y esta aplicación es bien fácil de utilizar. Simplemente se van a la página a www.menti.com y el código que, que Dipali ilustró en la diapositiva, el 899.59, lo colocan aquí y después podemos ya iniciar lo que es son ya las, eh, los juicios y como primer punto de qué país vienen ya veo que hay muchas ya eh, colocando la respuesta entonces por eso les pedimos a ustedes como que, que traten de, de, de qué país vienen Eh, volver a poner el código, por favor, eh, Michelle. Es el, es el 899.59. Y este código va a ser para todos los ejercicios. Entonces, por ejemplo, pongo aquí. I think uh, maybe a minute where everyone can just get a bit familiar and then we can move to the next one. Como mencionaba, eso es una ejercicio para que todos se familiaricen con la aplicación. Okay, great. Uh, we'll say, do we continue with the next one? Okay. How do we know if everyone had a chance to put this in? Um... Okay, perfect. And so we try with the next one. Yeah. Okay, let's do the next slide, please. I think uh, we've got quite a few here already, 16 people. So, uh, yeah, maybe we can. See. Uh, so, I should share my screen then now, right? So, yes. Back. Gracias a todos por favor.
Okay, great. Thank you for that. So, so now we know a little bit how to use this Mentimeter and uh, we'll uh, come up with a few more quizzes just to see, you know, what uh, everyone thinks and, and uh, some interesting uh, questions. But maybe before we go into that, uh, just uh, to go through, you know, some of the main concepts we'll talk about today, which are, you know, of course, relevant in the overall context and which uh, we'll also be then, uh, you know, picking up more in detail later. So, of course, it all starts at the policy level. So we'll have a little bit on, you know, the origin of EPR, uh, you know, what is the political, uh, you know, objectives for that, uh, the legislation um, instances in, uh, you know, different countries, how they've evolved, uh, what are the, the products, uh, the product scope typically under e-waste legislation around the world, what is the role of a producer, you know, given that it is about extended producer responsibility, who is a producer and what is the role and, you know, what does it really mean in terms of implementation uh, on the ground? So in, in, in real terms, in operationalization of the concept, mm -hmm. um, who is a PRO, uh, you know, the, the organization that is responsible then for fulfilling the EPR obligations? where they are positioned looking at the economics of the system then uh, you know the costs the the the, the values the fees etc what are uh, you know important aspects to keep in mind uh, in, in the the economics uh, side of things and also on the mass balance so you know the material and the money um, we look at a little bit on the fractions uh, in terms of you know the the, the uh, products that might have negative fra fractions and positive fractions uh, and, and, you know, hazardous fractions in particular, which will be um, a fairly large focus, uh, you know, of the webinars and is also for the Jeff project, actually, for the project overall, looking at how do you treat, how do you segregate, how do you depollute uh, products, uh, you know, especially the, the hazardous fractions, uh, which then can be then further treated. And then, of course, uh, a little bit on standards. Uh, how that plays into the overall picture. Uh, of course, you know, like in India, like in a lot of other developing countries, in the informal sector is a big part of the overall chain. So uh, we don't go into that. I just put those, um, uh, you know, concepts there because uh, we'll have another presentation on that. And uh, also awareness. I think these two concepts are fairly, fairly common, uh, you know, whether it is in, in uh, e-waste whether it's in uh, any uh, other kind of um, waste management awareness is a, a big aspect uh, you know towards making sure that uh, the implementation is successful so so we will have more detailed presentations and experts uh, you know picking up those topics as well so these are just some of the key concepts to to go into and uh, starting with uh, you know sort of the high level in terms of the objectives of uh, you know the EPR policies and and legislations being implemented or being introduced around the world, it started around the 1990s when it was much more around uh, protecting of the environment, uh, pr protecting the environment, and mainly diverting waste from the landfills, uh, which in many countries, especially in Europe, were getting full, and so. Uh, you know, they needed alternative, uh, you know, ways to treat waste, to manage waste. And also municipal budgets were under pressure. So it was, uh, you know, uh, not only was it expensive to dispose of waste, uh, you know, the municipal um, budgets were not available to, uh, to treat them. So, you know, there was this new concept of EPR to finance it and to make sure that, you know, the people who are, you know, with the most knowledge of the product have also the responsibility and, and the opportunity to make sure that it is collected and recycled. And then of course it built onto uh, the ideas of uh, the polluter pays principle and you know how that could be integrated into the product policies where you know the beneficiary of the product pays not the society at large uh, which is through taxation etc. And this led to the modernization of the entire waste sector in a way, and it was uh, helping build a lot of capacity and helping, you know, create the structure for management of waste in a more formalized manner. 
uh, it, it brought in, you know, additional financing. It brought in a lot of um, new technology and incentives to improve waste management. And then there was also not only at the end of pipe, but also upstream at the end, uh, you know, at the, the, the design phase, um, which is looking into eco design and how the environmental impacts of products could be reduced uh, right at the, the beginning, you know, when they are being designed and manufactured. So the, the chemical regulations like the ROHS, which is the restriction on hazardous substances is, is a good example of how already make sure products are less polluting, uh, even when they have to be treated at the end of life. Yeah. Uh, was there a question? No, no, it was the, the microphone of someone. Okay, no problem. Uh, but if you want to... These two are mostly, you know, uh, improvements around uh you know uh standards and treatment conditions and then you know bringing the whole perspective of the circular economy which is really about keeping the materials in a closed loop and you know continuing to use that uh, which you know uh, which has which has been kind of um, very successfully integrated into the epr framework so uh this is just to give a little bit the overall picture of how the epr concepts and and um uh, especially on electronics has developed uh, over the last uh, you know 20 odd years uh, michelle do you want to make a quick summary in in spanish for, for yes. anyone who you know found it a little challenging i know i was speaking a bit fast so i will try and slow down but uh, yeah don't hesitate to stop me if, if you have a question um Bueno, en la diapositiva anterior, Tiffany estaba eh, proveía un, un panorama de lo que va a ser la, la presentación y los conceptos que nosotros vamos a, a presentar. Eh, en esta diapositiva hablamos más acerca de los objetivos de la política eh, en referencia a la introducción de lo que es eh, la legislación REP. Eh, en, en 1990 se definieron los objetivos sobre cómo mejorar la protección del medio ambiente en lo que respecta a la gestión de las finanzas del sector y la evaluación, por ejemplo, de los vertederos y de aspectos sociales y ambientales. Y la mayoría, la mayor parte, perdón, de, de la carga financiera eh, antes se establecía en lo que era la sociedad en general. Y con el tiempo, a medida que la legislación comenzó a entrar en vigor, se consideró que era una forma de modernizar el sector de, de gestión de residuos. Eh, ya que proporcionaba incentivos para que la gestión del, del mismo fuera más eficiente y se vinculara con el, el valor de los productos y así elevar eh, los residuos y, y, y fue como <coughs> se fue fundamentando lo que es el, los objetivos del diseño ecológico y la idea de reducir la carga ambiental a través de un ciclo de vida y más recientemente ha habido formas de ajustar el sistema, mejorar las legislaciones en muchos países, así como mejorar la seguridad de las normas para la gestión de residuos. Y en el último par de años, los aspectos eh, como ser eh, de economía circular se han vuelto más eh, importantes. Y, y todo viene relacionado con lo que es crear incentivos y estructuras en el sistema para tener un, un circuito que es más cerrado. Um, si tienen preguntas, por favor, colóquenlas en el chat y yo les estaré dando a, a Dicano. Thank you, Dicano. You can proceed. Okay, great. Uh, super, thanks for that, Michelle. So, if um, you know, we just look at the various products that have, uh, oops, uh, it's not sure. yeah, uh, that, that are in scope of a typical e-waste legislation. You know, there are over 600 products, uh, you know, which, which come, uh, which fall in the definition of anything that has a plug or a battery and that runs on electricity. And uh, this has, you know, been more or less uh, categorized across six categories, six main categories. And, and these are, uh, you know, small IT, um, large IT, uh, uh, large equipment, lamps, uh, screens, and uh, small equipment like uh, microwaves and, and kettles and vacuum cleaners, etc. 
And, and the reason for doing this is really to make sure that the waste streams are collected in a way that makes it simple for them to be treated because they have similar treatment requirements. Uh, if you mix lamps with electronics, uh, you know, you contaminate even uh, you know those products that do not have the same kind of hazards, and and it makes uh, fractions much more hazardous and much uh, more difficult then to uh, you know recover materials from. So so these these are typically the categories that you know the the e waste is collected, the W triple E is collected in, and um, it's it's something that uh, you know uh, has implications on how it is financed and how it is then treated and, and what are the standards and, and other uh, requirements. Okay, so over here, I think, I mean, this is fairly clear. Any questions on, on this slide? Uh, I think I can it just translate very fast. Bueno, cuando hablamos de desechos electrónicos, el alcance de producto en los desechos puede ser simple o complejo. Esto dependerá del país y de su sistema de gestión. En Europa, normalmente nosotros des, eh, dividimos los desechos electrónicos en seis categorías, como podrán ver en la diapositiva. Y, pero eh, yo estaré ahondando un poco más, profundizando los temas referentes a estadística, clasificación de aparatos eléctricos y electrónicos utilizados a nivel mundial su aplicación y relación con otras clasificaciones como ser las UNUGIS, pero en una presentación en agosto, así que estén este, este, pendientes. Y como mencionaba Adipali, eh, a fin de asegurar que, que, los, que esos flujos sean recogidos de, de forma simple y que sean tratados adecuadamente, se, se clasificaba en seis categorías eh, ilustradas en, en las diapositivas a fin de, no solo de, de, de mejorar lo que es el tratamiento, sino que también facilitar eh, a los recicladores. Please continue the panel. I'm sorry. Okay, great. So maybe time for a little uh, quiz. Um, Michelle, if you could just switch to the Mentimeter, please. So uh, we saw that, you know, we have all these many, many hundreds of products and, uh, you know, the, the whole focus of policy has been on extended producer responsibility. So maybe here uh, would be a good chance to get a quick feedback on who is a producer, uh, you know, who would be qualified or who would be considered a producer and who should have this responsibility. Producer, distributor, importer, manufacturer. You can put more than one answer, uh, up to three possible. Okay, great. Okay, I think uh, we've got quite a few responses, 12 responses, and I think uh, manufacturers, importers, distributors are pretty common. Uh, Great. Okay, so um, yeah, super. So I think uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's great that uh, you know everyone has a fairly good understanding of who should be a producer, who should have the responsibility, and uh, you know it should be not just the the, the manufacturer, but also uh, you know all the other players in the value chain. Because it is a little bit about 
uh, you know, the shared responsibility as well, where, uh, you know, the manufacturer is, of course, uh, you know, the main um, stakeholder responsible, but also in a country, there is maybe no manufacturer. So it's the importer, the one who is benefiting from placing that product on the market. All right. So, uh, so, so that's, that's great. So, um, you know, now if we go to the next slide, uh, Michelle, um, it would be good to get a little bit of a sense. Okay. Now we know who the producers are and what the products are. Uh, no, no, keep it on the Mentimeter, please. So here, if uh, we had to, you know, place these four products, uh, refrigerators, mobiles, lamps, and toasters, how would you place them in terms of their material value on one side and the environmental impact on the other side? Uh, you know, to, um, you know, which producers should there be, you know, more responsibility allocated or less because their, you know, products have less environmental impact, which ones have more material value, which are more, you know, uh, profitable to recycle, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's a little bit of a refresher for those who were there last year, but for those who are new, it would be also interesting to see where, uh, you know, uh, these products are perceived. So, if you could, you know, maybe put in your thoughts on where these four products should go in terms of their environmental impact, uh, you know, high or low um, or medium and, and uh, what would be the material value. Okay. Maybe Michelle, if you, uh, you know, just clarify the question in Spanish. Uh, if, if I... Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, este, este, básicamente es para que ustedes eh, con estos cuatro productos eh, puedan evaluar eh, cuál tendrá el mayor impacto ambiental y el mayor el contenido acerca de, del material. Por ejemplo, ¿qué, qué producto contiene más valor, por ejemplo, de oro, plata. Entonces se van colocándolo uh, uh, de esta manera. Por ejemplo, ¿cuál producto es el que contamina más? Si tienen preguntas, pueden ponerlas en el chat y así lo las aclaramos. Okay, I think that's uh, 30 responses and I think it's it's pretty good. I think most people are uh, a very well informed group over here. So I think uh, we can go through the slides very fast, Michelle, because everyone has a fairly good idea of which products actually have a, you know, a higher uh, environmental impact uh, and a lower material. Oops, can you skip back to the other side, please? So, uh, so yeah, so, so some, uh, you know, uh, maybe changes, I, I think the, the uh, lamps are actually probably the lowest, uh, I would not probably put them even that high. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's just something that uh, we can uh, see what, what, uh, uh, you know, are maybe more interesting uh, thoughts on that. But, uh, okay, no, this is great. Maybe going to the next question, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, what are the products that would be, yeah, uh, more expensive to treat? Which one of those would you vote for? Okay. Yeah, I think again, a very well informed audience. Uh, everyone uh, is, is, you know, on the right side when you say the CRT monitor is much more expensive to treat uh, because of course you know nobody is manufacturing any more CRT manufacture uh, uh, CRT TVs or CRT monitors and you do have um, 
no dance stream for it. Uh, so it's it's a, a huge challenge to actually find a uh, you know, good treatment option, even if you sort and segregate and depollute it. But um, yeah, but this is actually uh, you know a really specific product. Uh, you know, with with uh, a really hazardous fraction with very little uh, treatment uh, possibilities. Okay, great. If uh, we go to the next question, then please. Okay, now this one is, yeah, just to understand what would be, uh, which product would have a negative net cost of, of recycling. Okay, lamps, mobile, refrigerators. Mm -hmm. Well, wait for a few more responses. So, interesting uh, to see mobiles coming up and going down. Maybe lamps winning still hands down. Uh, most people think. Uh, rightly and correctly that you know lamps are a negative cost item uh it's it's costs much more to treat them to collect them to recycle them uh so definitely lamps uh, with mobiles I mean, that's really interesting actually it's, it's a little bit of a trick question uh because you know lamps is very clear uh it's it's anywhere in the world a negative value fraction mobiles it depends whether you have to purchase it whether you need to pay to access that waste or if it is collected or if it is possible to collect for free and that's that's really what de decides whether you make money from the recycling or not and and that is hinging on of course the reuse of opportunities for those mobiles if it is used again and again if there are a lot of uh, reuse potential or if it is scavenged for parts you know the the cost of getting the the mobile waste is so high often that it makes it a negative fraction and with refrigerators it's also a little bit of a trick question because again it depends on the uh, on external factors like the commodity market so uh, you know, there are some treatment costs for refrigerators, but it also has, you know, a lot of uh, valuable materials, you know, uh, which can be recycled easily. You know, you have high quality plastics, you have steel, you have copper, and, and you can get a fair value for all these. And, and in, in some cases, when the metal prices are high, for example, this would be a very, you know, um, profitable fraction. And in other cases, if it is difficult to collect if you have very high collection costs and because it's bulky waste uh, if you have uh, to uh, you know pay for disposal of foam etc it makes it quite uh, expensive as well and sometimes it can be negative so so lamps is definitely winning hands down uh, it's it's always a negative cost item mobiles and refrigerators you need to know a little bit more the overall context uh, you know before uh, you know, having a chance to answer these questions, so uh, it's it's not so straightforward. These these uh, these, these products. Uh, maybe go to the next question then, uh, Michelle. Okay, the, this is the last question now for the moment on on products, and then we can jump back into our presentation. Uh, yeah, which one has a higher value? one would you know bring more money you know in recycling value terms okay 50-50. No, for um, a comparison, uh, we had the same question last year in, in Costa Rica, 
And uh, in, in that one, more than a third of the people voted for the refrigerator, which uh, they said that actually the refrigerator has the higher recycling value compared to the air conditioner. And, and here it's like a bit 50-50. And I think um, it's, it's also a little bit a trick question because it depends a lot on what type of gas the refrigerator has and you know what is the air conditioner does it have copper or does it have aluminum uh, and and also you know many many things uh, like um, what what is the the size and the capacity of each product so uh, again it's it's very difficult to just simply say that uh, you know all air conditioners are more valuable than, than all refrigerators. Uh, I can say all mobile phones are more valuable than all refrigerators, uh, you know, in terms of their recycling value. But air conditioners and refrigerators, again, it's it's a very, um, um, yeah, you need to have a little bit more information. So the reason to mention these and, and to, you know, have uh, these thoughts uh, and questions is really to say that it's not so easy to, Say, okay, these are products that need, uh, you know, a certain price and, and these are not, but each, each product in the context of EPR needs to be managed and depends on, you know, what is the context of the country, uh, you know, how that is then the overall cost for recycling. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your feedback there. I think it was uh, really interesting to see, uh, you know, all your responses and, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope, uh, you know, through the presentation, uh, you know, some of these are a little bit more elaborated. So I'm going to switch now back to the PowerPoint. I hope this works. Great. So when we were speaking of, you know, producers and, and you know, extended producer responsibility, it was really to look at also who is responsible at the end of life of the product and and typically you know the traditional product responsibility was in the first part which was focusing on you know the production of the product making it sure making sure it was safe it ran properly it you know it did what it said uh, you know in terms of the features and, and functions and then extending it beyond that use phase to say okay when it's at the end of life and it cannot be used anymore uh, you know, in the post-consumer life of, of that product, how do you make sure that it is collected, it is recycled? Okay. Do you want to, uh, Michelle, jump in now quickly to... You, you were saying? Yeah, I, I was muted by the host, but uh, I was saying that actually, Michelle, you could, uh, you know, just quickly jump in if, if you wanted to... Uh, to make a quick Spanish translation. Yes, I'm sorry. In this diapositive, basically, we're talking about what is the responsibility of extending the product. As we know, it's an instrument that obliges the fabricants and importers of certain products to consume massively, to organize, to design, and to finance the gestion integral of the residual derivatives of their products, basically. En la, normalmente la responsabilidad del productor tradicional uh, eh, se refería a lo que es la calidad de producción, funcionalidad y seguridad del producto. Pero a, también se tiene que tener en cuenta la responsabilidad del productor que se amplía a la, lo que es la etapa de postconsumo eh, mediante lo que es la responsabilidad extendida del productor, eh, mediante el manejo nacional al final de la vida útil del producto. Eh, si tienen preguntas, las pueden poner en el chat. Okay. Um, continue the, the next slide. Okay, great. So, um, so, so as a policymaker, you know, for all of you who are going to be looking at developing EPR policies, uh, you know, for eBase, uh, policymakers have a lot of tools at their disposal, and uh, you know, these can be at various uh, stages of the product life cycle and EPR typically fits in, you know, uh, where you have the, the, between the manufacturing and the consumption where you can like, uh, you know, the number four, which is, you know, charging advanced recycling fees 
or deposit refund schemes, uh, which are much more popular for packaging, et cetera, or you know, have uh, you know, non-monetary kind of instruments like collection targets and recycling targets, et cetera. So, so there are some incentives uh, there, and then there are some disincentives as well, such as having a, you know, very high landfill tax, et cetera, which helps to divert it towards recycling, uh, to divert the waste streams. So, uh, you know, policymakers have all these tools uh, at their disposal, uh, which, you know, that brings us to the question, okay, how do you design an EPR policy? Maybe before I go to the next slide, uh, Michelle, you, you want to do a quick wrap up on this piece? Podemos observar lo que es el panorama acerca de la herramienta y instrumento del REP a lo largo del ciclo de vida del producto y podemos observar que en varias partes del ciclo del producto hay incentivos y no incentivos. Sí, y por ejemplo, en la extracción de material virgen se pueden realizar o imponer impuestos de, de, de los materiales. Eh, en, en cuanto a lo que es el reciclaje, se pueden tener como normas de contenido de reciclaje. En lo que es la fabricación, se puede realizar un, una combinación lo que es eh, impuestos de subsidio en la fase inicial. Y en la etapa de consumo, se puede realizar lo que es la tasa anticipada de reciclaje. Y, Eh, perdón, estaba leyendo los uh, del chat, por si tenían preguntas. Y también en el caso del reino sanitario se pueden realizar impuestos, eh, básicamente para la disposición de, de los residuos. Eh, y esta, esta diapositiva fue adoptada por eh, el, la guía de responsabilidad extendida y aquí podrán tener el enlace de, de, del documento. You can continue, Lupita. Thanks. There's a question uh, in, in, in the chat. Que val, valioso este? The, the, uh, Luis Roberto is uh, saying that this slide is very valuable as an instrument for politics, uh, policies and application. Okay, cool. Okay, no, no clarity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so moving then to the next slide, which is actually, you know, how do you system. I mean, one of the questions you need to ask if you are uh, setting up an EPR system. And typically, this would be who pays. And, and you know, there are many options who pays, uh, to whom, and how much. And here you could say, okay, there could be, you know, the general taxation which pays. It could be the consumers who pay at the point of um, uh, purchase of the product. Uh, it's, it's not it's not producer responsibility. It's consumer responsibility. Uh, it could be uh, you know the waste holders who pay uh, you know which is at the point of disposal, and this is not very common actually. It's it's really uh, much more common for um, non domestic uh, household and uh, non domestic products. So it's for like business products or in some cases in Japan, even for household products. But the most common way is through EPR legislation where the producers have to set up a, a financial mechanism to, to pay for this collection and treatment of, of uh, end of life equipment. Question on who to whom, again, it depends on who pays and it could go to the state uh, as, as you know, a tax or an eco levy or a fee. Uh, it could go to a special organization, which is really created only for this particular function. Uh, and it's, it's run by the state or semi state owned. Uh, it could be a completely independent private sector for profit or non for profit organization, uh, which is often a PRO, a producer responsibility organization, or it can be just a service provider, a compliant service provider. And, and this is not uh, you know owned by the PRO uh, by, by the producer sorry but it's it's just an another company which provides waste management services uh, you know like uh, for other waste streams and then how much is uh, you know it depends on what is covered under these um, uh, under the legislation and then that is uh, 
really, you know, to see whether the full cost of the system, which includes collection, transport, recycling, and, you know, all the framework costs are covered. And, uh, yeah, and, and that really decides how much is then the cost of, uh, you know, the implementation. Now, the first two, which is, you know, who pays and to whom, are more a political decision. And this is, you know, something that is negotiated between the government and the industry typically. And uh, it's, it's a bit of back and forth. Uh, the next one, uh, which is uh, how much is, you know, to some extent political, but a, a, to, to a large extent, it's technical, where you need to know the baseline, you need to know the costs, you need to know the, uh, the, the technical um, infrastructure, uh, you know, in the country to be able to come up with that particular number. And of course, then it involves some negotiations, but it's it's it, you need some technical inputs there. Um, any questions over there quickly, or or should we move on to the next slide? I'm just conscious of the time because we are like almost approaching one hour, and and we still have a fair few concepts to go through. Okay, I guess all are, all all okay for that moment then. Uh, so, if, if we look at, you know, how this EPR has been implemented around the world, uh, there are four typical models in which way uh, you can see them. Uh, one is the state fund model, which is much more of an eco-tax, where you have the central, uh, the federal government in most cases, collecting this at the point of sale or at the point of import. And this is... Um, like any tax going into a central fund and then is used for, uh, you know, also, um, you know, e-waste management. There is typically the second one, which is the PRO model. And, and this is the most common way of uh, actually implementing EPR around the world, uh, especially in, in Europe and also now in Colombia, for example, where you have, you know, an industry led PRO being uh, in charge or responsible then for the collection uh, collectively, uh, collection, recycling, etc., of, of e waste collectively. A third model is a, a much more market driven model where you have a lot of uh, competition typically and it's, it's not, uh, you know, collectively run or managed, but, uh, you know, based on more competitive market principles and contractual negotiation power. Uh, between the various players. And this is much more common in Germany and Australia, not so much, uh, you know, in the rest of Europe. And there's a, in an in-between model, uh, which is a very hyper competition model in the United uh, Kingdom, in, in, in England, et cetera, where you have, you know, even trading of um, evidence, et cetera. So it's, it's trying to build in that competitive incentive uh, but, you know, of course, it has also, uh, you know, uh, challenges and, and sort of downsides to that. Uh, and then the fourth one is, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, more voluntary model, which is a recycler driven model where you have direct contracting between producers and recyclers. And this is, uh, you know, typically in countries which don't have legislation or have only very recent legislation. So the ecosystem is still not very developed. And, and uh, you know, some examples, of course, are India, where you still have a lot of producers directly contracting recyclers uh, or, you know, other countries like, uh, uh, like in Kenya or, or uh, even uh, South Africa, et cetera, where they are directly uh, voluntarily complying uh, under EPR, but uh, don't have the obligation to. I'll go through each of these models, uh, you know, a little bit to show what are their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but if, if there are any quick questions here, uh, maybe Michelle, you can uh, say a few quick words and then we can go into the next slides. No, there's no questions. But I can say something. For example, aquí in esta diapositiva podemos ver los diferentes modos. Uh, de implementación de, 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 de responsabilidad extendida del productor, cómo ser el, mundo, el modelo de fondo del Estado, el cual se puede observar en lo que es en China y en Ghana, eh, también así el, el, los cuales son dirigidos por PROs, como ser en Taiwán, 
eh, los modelos eh, PROs liderados por industria, eh, así también como el modelo impulsado por el mercado mediante contratos, eh, los cuales podemos observar en Alemania y en Australia. Este, este modelo es bastante competitivo y, y es bastante transparente. Y en medio podemos observar también un modelo de hipercompetencia, que es el cual se implementa en lo que es el Reino Unido. Y asimismo también podemos observar otro tipo de modelo que es impulsado por el reciclador, eh, como ser en India. Como verán, hay diferentes tipos de modelos eh, que se pueden observar en, en varios países. Y en las siguientes diapositivas ah, ah, ahondaremos o profundizaremos un poco más en los diferentes tipos de, de modelos de implementación de, 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 de la facilidad de extender el productor. Ok, great. Thanks for that. So if, if we go to, uh, you know, the first model, which is the state fund model, uh, you have the producer who basically is paying a, a fee or a tax, uh, you know, at the point of import or sale. It goes into a central state fund uh, and, and then, uh, you know, it's used towards all the various activities that are required. And, and here you have, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the financial and the organizational responsibility uh, separated where the financial responsibility remains with the producer in a way to pay the fees, to pay the, the, the taxes in a way. Uh, and then the organizational responsibility is, is with the government. And there are benefits to this because it simplifies it for uh, everybody. You just, you know, have a level playing field for all producers. And, you know, there is limited liability in the sense if you pay the tax, if you pay the eco levy, uh, you've met your obligation. Uh, you know, and, and so there are uh, not so many uh, yeah, uncertainties for producers there. But on the other hand, it has a lot of uh, challenges as well, where you might have, you know, already paid the funds for e-waste recycling, but then they are diverted. Uh, it's not very transparent and producers don't have then any influence on, you know, really being able to use that uh, for, um, you know, towards better, uh, you know, e-waste recycling or sound e-waste recycling. So you might have also cases where the, the fees are set at unrealistic levels, which do not cover the costs or which cover much more or which are much higher than what are probably uh, typical uh, costs. So, so there are some negatives over there. Going to the next one, uh, it could be much more like uh, the PRO model in, in Colombia, for example, which is from the, uh, which originates from the producers, you know, who come together collectively in an organization to create a producer responsibility organization. And this, the, the membership is, uh, you know, the, the producers who are obligated. So it's in their best interest, uh, you know, to make sure that uh, they have, you know, as, um, as, coherent and as, um, as simplified a procedure. Uh, it's, it's also good for you know, transparency and, and making sure that you can have uh, technical standards and a level playing field for all. Of course, this means that you do need producers who are competitors uh, mostly uh, also to, com uh, to collaborate. Uh, Las la presentaciones son las que están en español o lo que se leen. Sorry, Yeah, and and uh, and then of course, uh, you know, it it uh, means that. Maybe there are, um, you know, only cherry picking where everyone wants to work only on the more valuable fractions or more valuable products and, and not take care of the more hazardous or more uh, or the neg negative value products. So, um, again, some positives and some negatives. Okay, great. Um, and then, then uh, coming to the third model, which is uh, much more the market oriented the market driven model uh, which requires a central clearing house uh, you need to have uh, many producers who work with many recyclers 
and uh, you know there, there needs to be a way to to balance this and make sure that uh, you know the, the the producers who have the obligation bear their fair share of uh, the costs and then this needs a you know a, a more centralized coordination uh, through this um, clearing house or settlement center as, as it may be called of course it means that it's very competitive in the sense it you know helps build a competitive market and you can really uh, you know use that to benefit uh, the producers but it also means a lot of coordination it means a lot of administration uh, it needs a, a fairly advanced system with a high level of complexity and uh, it, it can you know lead to a race to the bottom uh, in terms of uh, the costs uh, where you everyone is trying to minimize costs but not the environmental gain so again some positives but also some uh, some negatives and then the final model which is uh, you know the fairly straightforward contracting model between the producer and the recycler uh, it's it's simple it's uh, you know a, a, a vendor and a um, client relationship it's very straightforward directly uh, negotiated costs with the recycler but it means that you do have uh, you know not a level playing field between producers some might get better prices some others not so much uh, you also have you know different um, uh, levels of, of uh, confidentiality uh, also there is the chance for double counting where you know uh, the, the recycler has the chance to allocate the same volume recycled to multiple producers because it's not a collective system because you know he can have the same evidence uh, you know shown to different producers and this is actually the case in India currently so I'm, I'm, I'm talking with a lot of uh, experience there of of the negatives of, of such a model so um so yeah that's a little bit on the four main types of of uh you know uh, organization or epr setups that can be possible or imagined and which are existing currently uh any quick questions uh until here or we can move to the next uh so there is one question uh, where it says like uh, these models, uh, the implementation of these models could be affected by the by COVID nineteen. How would it change the implementation of these models after COVID nineteen? Okay, that's a pretty interesting question, and uh, I think in terms of the impact of. COVID-19, uh, the biggest is, uh, you know, on the collection um, aspect and then the, 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 the fact that the collection is hampered and you do have to either take extra precautions or it's just not happening. You then have the whole downstream being impacted. So uh, you don't have the dismantlers with sufficient volumes and you don't have the recyclers then with uh, Know, the, the the required volumes and so the uh, you know overall the models might still continue and they still can you know hold uh, you know still be operational but the fact that uh, you know each of those actors in the value chain has some stresses uh, now because of covid-19 uh, it it might change a bit the price structure might change a bit the timeline so you know maybe what the, the volume that was probably recycled in a month takes much longer and and so you know it has various other impacts not on the model itself but on the uh, you know on the costs and, and the other kinds of uh, standards that might need to be brought in in terms of safety and health and precaution etc uh, i hope that answers a little bit the, the question i'm just going to translate very fast so if me disculpo si, si, si se pierde algo en la traducción, pero lo tengo que hacer eh, un poco rápido debido al tiempo. Eh, el mayor impacto ser, será en la recolección. Eh, la recolección será afectada porque eh, se tendrán que establecer eh, diferentes estándares, no más de cómo o realizarlos a fin de que no sea mayor contaminación. Los modelos operarán igual, pero los diferentes actores a lo largo de la cadena se verán afectados eh, por lo mismo, porque pueden experimentar los impactos en cuanto al costo, los estándares, eh, el tiempo en, en que el producto se va a reciclar, por ejemplo, eh, debido a que se tienen que tener 
distintas medidas eh, pertinentes para que no, no haya contaminación y la enfermedad no se propague más. Um, please continue. ¿Qué tal? Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so considering that, you know, the PRO model is uh, the most common one and, and uh, even if it is run by a government or, uh, you know, an, another organization, uh, typically, uh, you know, as a collective organization, uh, the, the, the job that a PRO needs to do or, you know, the, the uh, functions of a PRO are, you know, typically in these categories, these, these six main um, jobs or functions. Uh, first is to manage the whole financing, which is to collect the money from the producers and make sure that it is distributed to the right uh, vendors, you know, whether it's for collection, whether it's for transport, whether it's for recycling, whether it's for auditing. Uh, there are all these costs which are then, you know, of course, managed by the PRO. Uh, someone needs to organize the collection and, you know, the recycling activities. So it's, it's really the contractual aspect, uh, you know, calling in the, the offers and the, the bids, you know, having a tendering mechanism uh, to really organize, uh, you know, a physical collection if, you know, a collection center has, uh, you know, a full bin uh, sending it to the recycler with the right capacity or the, the, the treatment um, facility. So, so that's, you know, a much more operational activity. Uh, keeping uh, the, the, the trust in the system is also very important. And for this, uh, you know, the PRO needs to have a way to make sure that there are sufficient checks and balances and, and sort of monitoring in the system through audits and through a set of standards that, you know, everybody should follow. Uh, awareness programs are absolutely essential and, you know, really help to create that uh, understanding that e-waste needs to be managed separately. It should not be put in, in the normal waste bins. It needs to be sent to a special collection or recycling system uh, and, and then, uh, you know, really building that awareness uh, through various programs and conducting those programs, you know, with the community. Uh, th there's a lot of data transfer that happens. So there is uh, the data that goes from the producer to the PRO, from the PRO to the recycler, from the recycler back to the PRO, from the transporters, from the collection centers. So someone needs to, you know, organize this whole data system where, it, you know, it is matching, it is balanced, it is making sure that, uh, you know, there are enough red flags being raised if there is, you know, any kind of mismatches. And then, of course, uh, you know, in, in most cases, because these are, uh, you know, based on legislation, which has obligations on producers to provide reports and, you know, annual uh, or quarterly uh, returns, uh, the producer does this on the behalf on the behalf of its members uh, where, uh, you know, in terms of the, the volume collected, you know, based on targets, et cetera. So, so reporting is also a pretty big function uh, for a PRO. And if, if we look at it from a system point of view, so this was like, you know, from an organizational point of view, uh, looking at it from the, the system point of view, you um, have the PRO mostly operating in the bottom side of, uh, you know, the, the, the slide where it's really the, the technical costs that are, uh, you know, used uh, for um, uh, or collected by the PRO to collect the waste, to store it and aggregate it, to transport it and then send it for treatment. Some PROs maybe could cover some of these costs, uh, which are more the framework costs uh, in some countries. Uh, in some countries, this is also shared with the municipalities with the government uh, you know in terms of auditing in terms of uh, enforcement etc so together you know there are the technical costs which are you know really the day-to-day -day operational costs and then there are you know more the framework costs to make sure that the operations run smoothly and and this is uh, really you know the um, operational aspect or you know epr in practice it means actually having set up these systems to be able to, uh, you know, understand what are the costs, who are the players, and also the fr framework costs. So, uh, and the framework required. So, you know, having a system, uh, you know, for auditing, having the, the standards to audit against, uh, making sure that, you know, the awareness is uh, being created. Uh, you have, you know, other costs, uh, you know, such as, uh, uh, yeah, research and development of new technologies, etc. 
Okay, so uh, in, in, if you look at uh, the overall picture, uh, sorry, there's a question. Communication and promotion of the ERP is included in the sense of sensibilization. Yes, it's it's the, the one on awareness raising, uh, the conscientization. Sorry for that. Uh, maybe Michelle, if you could help a bit over there, please. Um, so the question is like if uh, communication and uh, awareness is, uh, of the EPR is included in the sensibilization cost or in others. Uh, which is the sensibility awareness uh... yeah 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 that that's exactly that so uh the awareness cost is is part of the epr costs so together the the, the overall system costs the whole thing uh you know the pros are always responsible for the bottom part and then sometimes uh and, and it, it differentiates uh, between PROs, whether they do the audits themselves or not, whether they do the uh, awareness uh, themselves uh, collectively or you know, together with uh, the government, etc. So uh, these are the more framework costs on the top and the technical costs at the bottom. And, and, and the reason to, to differentiate is also because, you know, the technical costs, uh, most of them are negative. So, you know, you need to pay to access ways to collect it, to transport it, to aggregate it. Uh, you might have, you know, some revenues for treatment, but it's not always the case. Uh, it depends on the products, uh, on the volumes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, potentially some revenues in certain cases, and uh, you know, for these, it's, it's really all about uh, you know activities that need to happen, uh, which help to keep the system running, the, the system at the bottom. Uh, a percentage of costs is is that the question? Uh, uh, have you estimated uh, worldwide cost percentages? So typically, uh, you know, this is about eighty or ninety percent of the cost, of the bottom, in the technical costs, and the uh, uh, the other costs, which is administration and awareness, auditing and enforcement, are less than ten percent by and large. And it depends over here at the bottom, uh, which costs are more or less, or, you know, in some countries you have to pay quite a lot to access waste, in others not at all. Uh, you know, in, in other countries you have very high treatment and, and depollution costs uh, in, in other countries that, that is different. But overall, the costs, the technical costs are the main costs and, and the, the more costs are very So I'm going to translate very fast. Los costos técnicos normalmente cubren lo que son el 80-90% y los costos estructurales cubren lo que es entre 10 a 20%. Los otros costos que ven en rojo aquí son costos acerca de, de auditorías, de reportar a, a, la, a la institución responsable, garantías, concientización y los, los costos técnicos son más acerca de, de, la, de la infraestructura, como sea el transporte, acceso a los residuos y entre otros. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, if, if we, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, building on from the question in terms of uh, where the money flows or what is, you know, money required for an assistant, you may need access to uh, waste and you need to pay for that. Uh, you need to, you know, pay for the collection, the, the, the transportation and treatment and the recycling. And sometimes you can get money, sometimes you have to pay for it. So this is why there's a plus and minus. And on top of this, uh, you know, the, the whole system, is sitting the legislation. So you have, uh, you know, the, the, the legislation which impacts all these different actors, whether it's the producer or whether it's, you know, the, the collection system. And this could be small repair shops to, you know, informal collectors, the, the informal, uh, 
you know, waste managers, uh, uh, sorry, informal sector uh, recyclers to formal waste managers, uh, waste management companies. And uh, going all the way to, uh, you know, having uh, authorization and, and uh, treatment for uh, standards for recycling, as well as, uh, you know, the downstream market, which could have, uh, you know, uh, restrictions, for example, of what is possible to export or import, and this is linked to, of course, you know, the transboundary movements of wastes. So, uh, so, so you have legislation and regulation which really impacts at all these, uh, you know, different stages. Uh, you know, whether uh, it's it's at collection, whether it's storage, uh, you know, what are the transport, uh, you know, for hazardous wastes, etc. What are the definitions, etc., which you know impact all these things. Uh, and, and that's all, uh, you know, part of, of the, the regulatory framework. Um, oops, I don't know what happened there. Sorry for that. Uh, okay, maybe here's time to take a little bit of a break from the, the slides and, and go back yeah. to, to Mentimeter. Uh, Michelle, could I ask you to please switch back to your screen? So, so now, you know, knowing a little bit about EPR and, and you know, what the, the entire system kind of entails, how would you see this in, in each of your countries, you know, to introduce an EPR based legislation for WEEE, how much time, you know, do you see that taking or what would be kind of a time frame uh, to look at? Okay, that's great. There's quite a few legislations then on their way. Uh, two to three years, four years is, is a pretty good timeline. It's it's um, it's ambitious, but also doable. I think many countries have done it, and I think uh, we have good examples in Latin America as well. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's it's great to see that there is you know quite a lot of uh, yeah movement on on legislation and policy, and and I think uh, yeah also it's quite quite uh, good to see or or yeah at least uh, the need is is there because uh, nobody voted for that there is no need for epr legislation so uh, so that's also i think um, great that at least this is uh, a fairly clear uh, requirement across all all countries that legislation is needed Okay, maybe switching to the next one. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Michelle. So, in terms of imports, you know, a lot of uh, questions uh, often pop up in terms of the uh, imports of of secondhand goods, uh, because of course they have their benefits, but you know, also there are uh, sort of downsides. How do you see these for your countries? You know, whether they should be banned or allowed and you know what should be uh the basis of, of the legislation mm -hmm. that's interesting just gonna see uh, what did we do last year on this question Fourteen. Maybe we wait for a few more. Okay, that's interesting. Do you have to send to you the answer about these questions? Uh, no, I don't need the answers directly. I mean, it's it's best to just do this. Uh, it's anonymous, so I don't see who is answering these questions. Uh, and it, yeah, it's best to do this, uh, you know, through the Mentimeter and we, we have a view from everybody without any specific name. So it's, it's anonymized. Okay, great. So it's, it's quite interesting because I was just comparing it to the last year and uh, last year, five uh, of 27 had said that, uh, you know, um, imports should be banned uh, 
15 had said no imports should not be banned and uh, quite a few were it's still not decided uh, so so more or less uh, half had said that uh, you know imports should be banned and uh, i think uh, it's it's flipped a bit this year where i think uh, the imports being banned have a far far greater share and and um, those who are still undecided have uh, also shrunk quite quite considerably. Okay, that's almost 50-50 for both uh, to be banned or not to be banned. That's interesting. Okay, great. So um, if I might just switch back uh, to the presentation then. Okay, thanks for that. Where am I here? Okay, so uh, yeah, just coming back a bit to you know the products and uh, you know what would make sense to to have uh, to include and and why uh, you know to include these products uh, in an EPR legislation based on their categorization, uh, you know the products that we saw uh, the product categorization that we saw earlier. It's really to see where the environmental impacts are the highest and also where uh, you know, the, the material value is either too low or, or negative and, and you know, really not uh, incentivizing uh, proper recycling. And for all, all the products, uh, you know, it's, it's very much the case that either it has a high environmental impact, but not sufficiently you know, high material value, or it has uh, you know, maybe a high material value, but then a very high environmental impact as well. Uh, if it's not treated and processed uh, properly, so 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 that's why uh, you know it's it's uh, it, it helps to keep this categorization in mind uh, when also you know developing and thinking about the legislation. And and this is really all to do with the material balance in a way, uh, which is on the one side looking at the mass, and then on the other side the profits. Uh, you know if you look at the the breakdown of the total mass of electronics, a very large share. So maybe if I just try and do some annotation here. Uh, so a very large share. So this whole part over here is is actually just steel. Uh, you know the mass balance. Uh, the, the more than fifty percent is actually ferrous. Uh, a lot of it is also plastics now, and uh, you know then you have all these other kinds of. Um, uh, fractions and the most the, the the valuable fraction is is really really tiny it's the very small fraction of uh, printed wiring boards but if you look at what is the most valuable fraction uh you know if this is the print oops sorry um if this is the printed wiring boards it's about three percent four percent across all the uh product categories uh that tiny tiny fraction in in the whole uh, mass balance has the, the the majority of the share of the um, profitability. So the the material value really comes from just this very small fraction, and which is why everyone wants this. That's the cherries, and that's why everyone wants to, uh, you know, have their hands on. Uh, whether it's the informal sector, whether it's you know formal recyclers, uh, that's the first fraction everybody's interested in. And of course, it needs, you know, from the policy side to balance a bit the whole mass and the profitability side uh, to make sure that uh, even those large fractions, which may not be very profitable in plastics is a good case uh, because there are a lot of uh, uh, aspects to, you know, the different types of polymers, uh, you know, things which have hazardous fractions uh, of plastic with, with brominated flame retardants, etc which are uh, you know also a challenge to recycle and don't bring any value but are net cost actually negative fractions and uh, so so that's that's quite important to have this you know understanding of where's the value where, where are the costs and uh, of course uh, in, in the in the overall webinar series we will we'll talk a lot more about uh, these aspects uh, especially the hazardous fractions uh, especially plastics etc and also on you know the 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 treatment and recycling of um, 
precious precious fractions uh, profitable uh, you know valuable fractions and uh, the treatment opportunities for that okay any questions until here uh, maybe michelle if you can just quickly summarize this this slide because i know it's a fairly complicated one and i've made a mess but i hope it was not not too uh, difficult i was trying to speak a bit slow slowly but uh, yeah michelle, it might help if you would just clarify it quickly in spanish please Um, bueno, le voy a hacer un breve resumen de esta diapositiva. Yo sé que es un poco compleja, así que si tienen algunas preguntas de, de esta diapositiva, por favor, escríbenlas en el chat. Uh, básicamente, um, aquí se, se da como un panorama acerca del balance de masa y la rentabilidad de, de lo que es el, el tratamiento de RAI. Y podemos observar que la mayoría, como Dipali ilustró en, en, en verde, eh, la mayoría de los productos contienen lo que son la, 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 la parte ferrosa o hierro eh, y también la parte de lo que es plástico que se puede observar en, en rojo y solo un 3% aproximadamente es lo que constituye el, el, lo que tiene valor eh, intrínseco en los productos que, es, que son los, eh, los, eh, los circuitos, eh, los PCBs. Y es por ello que es importante que, que las políticas, que las normas, que la legislación haga un balance entre lo que puede ser eh, tratado. Eh, porque lo malo es que en algunos, en algunos países y en algunos recicladores eh, tratan únicamente de, de reciclar o de tratar aquellos productos que contienen, que contienen mayor eh, fracciones de valores como ser eh, celulares o, o computadoras que otros, eh, otros tipos de productos como ser eh, yeah, otro tipo de productos entonces es muy importante que en la legislación se tenga contemplado eso eh, que se tenga que tratar ambos ambos tipos de productos ya sea los que contienen bastante valores como, como los que no de una forma equitativa si tienen preguntas, por favor, eh, incluyan en el chat y en la siguiente diapositiva estaremos hablando un poco más detalladamente de, 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 de lo que son eh, los fundamentos económicos de RAI y, y podrán ver un poco más de forma ilustrativa eh, lo que mencionaba. And you can proceed, Dipa. Ok, great, thank you. Okay, so, uh, you know, looking at the mass balance and the profitability, of course, uh, you know, everybody, oops, sorry, uh, I'm going to try and stop my annotation so I can move to the next slide. Okay, so, um, looking at, you know, how uh, the, the, the economics of the recycling uh, works, so, uh, you have uh, the, the treatment plant, uh, which accepts waste, uh, which accepts e-waste, and this is typically, uh, you know, in tons or kgs. Um, and then it sends sells uh, fractions, and this could be with a positive value or with a negative value. So, you know, imagining if you have a, a mobile phone, uh, you get, you know, a kg or a ton of mobile phones, and then you break it up into fractions like the PCBs, uh, the printed wiring boards, uh, which are a positive value fraction, or uh, you know um, uh, plastics uh, or, or you know the, the rubber pads etc which are typically negative value fractions and then uh, you know you have additional costs uh, you know to collect to uh, you know pay the energy bills you have the depreciation of the material uh, the, the the plant machinery you know manpower costs etc uh, and and of course uh, overheads etc which you know provide you with a total cost of uh, your treatment and this is uh, you know then the if, if, if your negative value fractions are more than the positive value fractions you have a net negative uh, negative treatment cost and if there is you know a higher fraction of uh, the, the positive value fraction it's a, a net positive treatment cost and And this is basically the crux of, you know, calculating, uh, you know, at a recycler level, the economics or at a system level, the economics. And, you know, that would then help decide 
what should be the level of the, the recycling fee or, uh, you know, the, the eco levy or whatever, you know, is the, uh, the mechanism to collect the, 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 the fees, the, the recycling costs, um, uh, you need to aggregate the costs for recycling, whether positive or negative, uh, from the various different uh, recycling plants and then, uh, you know, aggregate it across the system to come to, uh, you know, um, a nationwide or a system-wide uh, EPR cost. Okay, any quick questions there uh, on, on this? Uh, Michelle, maybe for you to just quickly summarize that, please. Yes, yes. Um, bueno, las plantas, las plantas de tratamiento eh, aceptan lo que son los residuos eh, a ser procesados y estos producen lo que son fracciones con valor positivo y fracciones con valor negativo. Eh, Dipali mencionaba como por ejemplo las fracciones con valor positivo pueden ser en los celulares, en los PCBs, eh, eh, que, que lo van a agregar en eh, diferentes materiales. Y, y luego se tiene lo que son los costos adicionales como, como ser el costo de la mano de obra, el costo de energía, la depreciación y otros costos. Y todo esto se, se tiene, eh, eh, sumándolo se tiene lo que son los, uh, los costos totales de tratamiento. Y si el costo total de tratamiento es mayor a, a, a lo que son las fracciones, entonces se tiene lo que es eh, negativo. Y en caso de que sea lo contrario, se tiene lo que es un costo pos eh, positivo del de tratamiento. Eh, esto es básicamente, en resumen, eh, lo, cómo se calcula a nivel de, de, de organización y sistemático lo que son los, eh, los valores de tratamiento. Y es importante que se puedan agregar estos costos de reciclaje a través del sistema a fin de, de equivaler lo que son los tipos de costos. Uh, uh, okay, great. So, um, so of course, uh, you know, if you have uh, the different perspectives of a recycler, uh, you know, from the producers, the industry, or a policymaker, uh, from the recycler's perspective, of course, you want uh, you know, the net treatment costs to be higher. Uh, from an industry perspective to be lower, from a policymaker's perspective, it, it, neutral, whether it's higher or lower. Uh, in terms of quality standards, uh, typically, you know, policymakers and, and industry want it to be higher uh, so that, you know, you can, uh, of course, have a better outcome for society. Uh, recyclers have a mixed view, but the larger recyclers, you know, the more formal recyclers, they prefer to have higher quality standards, actually, because it helps uh, you know drive volumes towards their facilities rather than you know going to informal recycling so they are pretty uh, interested in having high quality standards but of course it costs money and uh, you know it provides a level treatment uh, level playing field for all treatment facilities where you know you don't have then the the price advantages from illegal activities from you know uh, disposal of you know hazardous fractions uh, without the right uh, uh, without the right uh, facilities, etc., and for policymakers, it's important to have all these in mind uh, because you know there are different competitive pressures between large and small recyclers and the industry, uh, which wants you know different levels of uh, you know uh, implementation standards, etc. Okay, uh, going quickly to the next slide because I'm conscious uh, that you know we're really running a little bit behind time already and uh, if there are any questions uh, we won't have much more time uh, so standards is uh, you know the reason why I thought uh, maybe we uh, spend a little bit time on because um, these are important to you know have a level playing field as I mentioned in the previous slide but they also make help to provide uh, you know, the criteria to audit against to make sure that the system is, uh, you know, working and is doing what the objectives are to make sure that, you know, recycling happens properly. And uh, typically you have, uh, you know, the six waste streams being diverted through the, um, through the treatment facilities, to the recyclers where it is, you know, going through the, the various processes of uh, um, depollution, first of all, and then dismantling 
And this is typically the pre-processing side where you have, you know, a, a fair bit of manual dismantling as well. Uh, and then, you know, you have uh, the, um, the second part, which is, you know, the, the recovery at the end processing. And this is when you start recovering the end uh, of life, uh, uh, sorry, the, the raw materials, uh, you know, from the end of life uh, equipment. So when you start recovering the glass and the plastics and uh, the, the iron, uh, actually from those fractions. And the economics of recycling depend a lot also on how efficient your process is, uh, also what the standards are, what are, uh, you know, the minimum requirements, etc. And, um, and then, you know, technology plays a role in both, uh, you know, in making sure that you have uh, better quality fractions uh, and, you know, that they are recycled to the best possible efficiency and uh, safety and, and you know, um, making sure that uh, you have the right uh, controls in place. And, and in all these cases, you know, this is where you need to, you know, look at how it's, uh, you know, uh, define how the standards are established to make sure that, uh, you know, it provides a level playing field to everybody. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, that was, a very quick uh, run through of the various uh, main main topics, the the key aspects and the uh, concepts that will be covered in uh, the rest of the seminars, uh, the, the webinar, sorry, as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to skip to the slide which has uh, you know all the upcoming webinars. So um, you know that's where we are in terms of uh, you know understanding the key concepts and. Um, Stephanie from the US EPA will follow uh, this presentation, this webinar with a more uh, in-depth dive into the, the legislative side and what would be key guiding principles to set up uh, and, and you know, establish legislation. Uh, Lucia will look much more on the financing and the technical operation side. Uh, you know, she's coming from the We Forum, which is a, a membership organization bringing together different PROs from around Europe and now also around the world, actually. Uh, they've got members in India and in Australia, soon in South Africa, etc. So uh, so they've got a long history and, and a lot of experience in um, the operational side uh, from a PRO perspective. Uh, transboundary movements is an important topic, uh, especially when it comes to hazardous fractions that need to be shipped, you know, when uh, countries do not have facilities uh, to, to treat those, uh, you know, uh, in, in domestically, how do you make sure that they can be treated, uh, you know, whether it's positive value fraction or a negative value fraction, uh, you know, in other countries and, you know, what are the requirements for these uh, transboundary movements. Um, collection, logistics and transport is, you know, of course, a very big chunk, uh, you know, as I mentioned, as, as uh, the question was asked, uh, you know, what is the distribution of costs? And this is really where a lot of that cost lies in the collection, the logistics, the transport, etc. So uh, how, how is that organized? What are some of the learnings uh, from Europe on organizing all of these? Um, the health impacts and, you know, the toxicological uh, side of e-waste and, you know, whether it's being uh, recycled, uh, you know, with informal practices or, you know, what, uh, what could be implications of uh, improper handling uh, is something that uh, we'll also touch upon as it's quite linked to the standards, whether it's, you know, uh, labor standards, whether it's uh, working um, kind of uh, precautions. Uh, and, and, you know, here, I think, uh, you know, the question on, on COVID uh, might be quite relevant because uh, treatment standards would need to maybe be adapted to you know, put in place uh, various uh, things like social distancing, et cetera, for example. Um, so, so that's something uh, which will be followed up on as well. Um, Michelle will be then presenting in uh, July, the uh, August actually, sorry now, uh, the, the update to the global e-waste monitor and looking especially at how the statistics and the calculation, uh, the inventorization of uh, e-waste is uh, done, uh, you know, all the latest numbers uh, which, uh, which have been, which will have been published by then. Um, then we have a couple of presentations from the countries. Uh, I think uh, this will be really interesting to see where each of the countries are in their progress, uh, you know, on uh, uh, in the project and, you know, in terms of their 
development of the legislation and the system. Uh, Heinz will look at, uh, you know, the hazardous side of it, uh, looking very much on the hazardous fractions. How do you identify? How do you treat them? Uh, what are, uh, you know, uh, international best practices, guidelines, etc., for BFR, so flame retardant plastics and, and lead glass in particular, you know, as I mentioned from CRTs and, and the plastics with flame retardants. And uh, he'll also follow up with another presentation which focuses specially on plastics. And uh, this is uh, really going to uh, a very useful resource. Uh, it's, it's a very practical handbook, uh, also available in Spanish uh, on the processing of V plastics. And then the final presentation will be on the informal sector and formal sector partnerships and, and you know, some of the uh, work that's been going around, uh, going on around the world on how the informal sector can be integrated, uh, you know, through various different mechanisms uh, on, on the, uh, in, in EPR, in an EPR context as well. So that's a little quick snapshot, uh, you know, of the upcoming presentations and, and link to where we stand with all these various key concepts and, you know, how we take them forward, how we integrate all these, uh, you know, over the, the next couple of months uh, to uh, go deeper and dive deeper into each of these topics uh, and, and uh, have a chance to, uh, you know, at least have a common understanding of these concepts by the time we have a chance to meet, uh, hopefully, at the end of September, early October, uh, we see how that goes. But um, that's just a quick uh, sneak peek uh, into the, the coming webinars and um, the, how they're linked to the key concepts. So I think that's more or less it from our side. Uh, I think we had another couple of questions. Uh, Michelle, if you could just switch uh, to the, the meeting call. Yes. Y esta sería la, la, la última pregunta que nosotros le tenemos a ustedes a fin de tener un poco más, mayor conocimiento de cuáles conceptos clave que ustedes desean tener más información. I think there was one question before this as well, right? Or... No, this was the important one. Yeah, this is the important one. Yeah, this one. Uh, is this the, the, the keywords and the key concepts? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool, great. Is it working? Costs, okay, great. <laughs> balances okay uh, economic models treatment okay interesting balances ERP role of PROs cost of EPR the composition of V okay I think we have most uh, of the responses uh, it's very interesting, you know, uh, the last year we did this, uh, the same question uh, we asked, you know, what would be the keywords, uh, you know, for you are interesting or you'd like to know more. And it was about EPR, actually. And EPR was like the number one uh, concept to, to know more about. Uh, there was also cherry picking, uh, stakeholders, uh, free riders, um, incentives. Costs were much lesser in focus. I think uh, it's, it's great to see that, you know, a lot of 
that um, uh, understanding of EPR has built in, and now we can move to the next level, which is really about getting into the nitty gritty of implementation, which really is balancing on cost. So, so this this is really great. Um, I'm quite pleased uh, actually that uh, we, we have a chance to next uh, you know, pick up on these topics, and and I think uh, this is really useful in also helping shape the the next webinars and uh, you know what could be the focus uh, topics and, and what maybe the presenters could uh, look at a bit more uh, in depth. So that's that's really great feedback. Thank you. Okay, great. So I think uh, if uh, there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if if um, yeah, if, if uh, there are uh, you know questions later, I'm also uh, you know available on email. Uh, Michelle and I uh, you know, uh, can share our emails with them if we don't already have them. And um, yeah, with this, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, you know, for joining. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, it was, uh, I hope, not not too challenging. Uh, you know, with uh, the English, the silent, not, not simultaneous, but uh, English uh, Spanish uh, translation. So. Yeah, thank you so much for your attention and uh, happy to answer any questions. Bueno, como Dipari mencionaba, les queremos agradecer mucho a todos por su paciencia, por su tiempo, por estar aquí en esta presentación y esperamos que, que el, el, el idioma no, no, sea, no se les haya hecho muy difícil. Y si tienen cualquier pregunta, eh, la pueden incluir ahorita en el chat. Si se sienten un poco tímidos, entonces también nos pueden mandar la pregunta vía correo. Yo creo que ustedes tienen ambos el correo de Ipari como el mío. Eh, y estamos aquí para apoyarlos. Eh, básicamente esta, esta presentación era para proveerles a ustedes un, un refrescar la memoria acerca de, de lo presentado en el UAM anterior y, y crear la base para, para, para las siguientes presentaciones de los siguientes webinarios. Entonces, para nosotros fue un placer estar con ustedes aquí, compartir eh, este tiempo y los conocimientos. Y si tienen cualquier pregunta, estamos a la orden. Um, there, there's a lot of congratulations. Um, muchas gracias a todos. Yo veo que no hay muchas preguntas eh, y yo creo que en aras del tiempo vamos a, a solicitarles a los participantes que si tienen preguntas pues pueden enviarlas también por correo electrónico a, a Dipal y a Michelle o a mí y con gusto pues daremos respuesta a las preguntas que tengan. Eh, solamente me resta agradecerles a, a Michelle. Thank you Michelle, thank you Dipali for your continued support and the presentation. I think it has been very useful and guiding for the participants of the project uh, to the extent that the efforts that are being made in the region in regulatory matters uh, in the short term should be translated in the, into the implementation of some of the, of the PR application models you exposed. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, yo creo que la presentación, pues, podemos resumirla en, dos, en tres grandes grupos. Una parte de principios eh, regulatorios, de política, que creo que van a ser bastante útiles para todos nosotros en los procesos que estamos llevando a cabo. Después, eh, unos aspectos técnicos que creo que es necesario tener en cuenta para entender un poco este tema del reciclaje y los aspectos económicos que vienen asociados para posteriormente la implementación de un sistema de financiación. Como se mencionó durante la presentación, más adelante vamos a ahondar un poco en los mecanismos de financiación en temas económicos que veo que son algunas de las inquietudes que tienen ustedes. Eh, como lo mencionaba Dipali, en el cronograma que tenemos planeado vamos a tener a Lucía Herreras que va a hablar un poco sobre esos temas. Eh, y solamente recordarles entonces que nuestro próximo webinar va a ser dentro de 15 días, el 26 de mayo, a la misma hora, es decir, a las 17 horas de, de Europa Central para que ustedes eh, separen en sus, en sus agendas la hora local. Y vamos a tener entonces a Estefan Adrián de la Agencia de Protección Ambiental de Estados Unidos hablando sobre los principios rectores para desarrollar sistemas de gestión de residuos electrónicos y legislación. 
una guía de, de Steph que ella va a exponer eh, nuevamente porque lo hizo ya en, en Costa Rica el año pasado. Entonces creo que va a ser de bastante um, utilidad para todos. Agradecerles una vez más por su participación, por su puntualidad, además porque la gran mayoría estuvo muy, muy puntual a las 10 de la mañana. Bueno, para Colombia y Perú, quiero decir, en nueve en países centroamericanos. Agradecerles por su puntualidad y... Bueno, eh, esperándolos entonces dentro de 15 días, este, el próximo webinar lo vamos a hacer abierto para que inviten también a, a las partes que ustedes consideren que son de interés. Eh, creo que, que va a ser bastante orientador también, de manera que eh, pues los esperamos. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias a todos. Buenas noches. Noches. Gracias. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Muchas gracias, excelente y felicitaciones a todos. Hasta luego. Thank you, everybody. Just, 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 I, have a, I have a question, Gabriela from Uruguay. The, the slides are going to be sent by you. It's going to happen with the, with the slides. Thank you. Nosotros enviamos. Las la presentaciones. Sí. Tú cambiarás las presentaciones y la grabación. Sí. Ok, thank you, Luca. Uh, thank you, Deepali. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Everyone. Have a good day. Take care. Bye bye. 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 Carlos. Sí, acá estoy. Um, a el recording. Sí, por favor. Gracias. Yes.